Good morning. My name is Bill O'Brien. I'm the head football coach at Penn State. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm honored to be here today. Uh, this is uh, obviously a subject that is near and dear to, to, to my heart, uh, to our football program's heart, and, and to the university. And so I'm very, very honored to be here today. And I'm also honored to be here today to, to introduce our, our special guest. And they, they gave me some things to read, but I could probably do it off the top of my head because when I was growing up, uh, I was a huge boxing fan and still am, and, and I remember all of, the, all of the, the boxing matches and the fights that, that, that Sugar Ray was in, especially the Roberto Duran Nomas one. That was my personal favorite. But, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard is one of the legendary sports icons of the 20th century, whose very name epitomizes boxing and conjures the image of a champion. Having learned to box at the age of 14, Sugar Ray Leonard's illustrious career includes three National Golden Gloves titles, two Amateur Athletic Union Championships, and the 1975 Pan American Games crown. After winning a gold medal in boxing at the 1976 Olympic Games, he turned professional to help his family defer mounting medical bills incurred because of his father's illness. Blinding speed, Tremendous power and great charm turned Leonard into an immediate media favorite. The late Howard Cosell called Leonard the new Muhammad Ali. Sugar Ray Leonard won a gold medal during the 1976 Olympic Games. In 1977, at the age of 20, Mr. Leonard won his first professional fight, setting the stage for a collection of the most memorable fights in history. He went on to defeat some of the finest boxers of the modern era, including Wilfred Benitez, Roberto Duran, Thomas Hearns, and Marvin Hagler, from whom Leonard won the world middleweight title. During his 20-year professional career, he also won world titles in the welterweight, junior middleweight, super middleweight, and light heavyweight divisions. He was the first boxer to win world titles in five different weight classes a record that stands to this day. In addition to his recent appearance on ABC's Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> where you will never find me, Sugar Ray Leonard was host and mentor of the critically acclaimed show The Contender for seasons one through three, which premiered September 4th, 2007 on ESPN. The Contender was produced by DreamWorks Television and Mark Burnett Productions. Season four of The Contender recently aired on the cable sports channel Versus, formerly known as the Outdoor Life Network. Mr. Leonard recently served as a choreographer on the fight scenes for the hit movie Real Steel. He is also the author of an autobiography titled The Big Fight, My Life in and Out of the Ring. Mr. Leonard's sincere, charismatic personality, coupled with his ring experience, led to a successful career as a te television broadcaster for NBC, ABC, HBO, and ESPN. Leonard is also among the most sought after motivational, inspirational speakers in the world today. His speech titled, Power, Prepare, Overcome, and Win Every Round, is consistently booked with major Fortune 500 companies in the United States and abroad. Successful business ventures aside, he has always been devoted to the community and to helping those in need. For many years, Mr. Leonard has been the international chairman of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation Walk for a Cure. He also participates in a variety of national and international causes benefiting children's charities. Today he joins us, too, as an adult survivor of child sexual abuse. He reminds us that child sexual abuse is far too prevalent in our society, but shows us the resiliency of one committed to overcoming the trauma. We welcome Sugar Ray Leonard to Penn State University and to this community of those committed to preventing child sexual abuse in the future. Sugar Ray.
Thanks. Thank you, Coach. Um, I, I thought about um, writing a speech, um, but I could not have thought of anything that would sound or make any sense. So I'm just standing here um, as I am. Um, it's just, it's difficult right now to, for me to think or go back to what happened to me over 40 years ago. Um, it's hard to believe that I've been a fighter for over 30 years. And I have faced some of the toughest oppositions in the world. I mean, just the mere mention of their names will strike fear in their opponents' hearts. For any, any of you boxing fans out there, there were names like Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Tommy the Hitman Hearns, Roberto, Manos de Piedras Duran. I mean, these guys were the creme de la creme, the best of the best, each one of them a living legend. And yes, I beat them all. I beat them all. And that is one of many reasons why I am here today. And yes, I am one of them. I am a survivor of sexual child abuse. Last night, I was at dinner here with my, my friends and, and my daughter, Camille. And um, I said to Camille, I said, Camille, you know, tomorrow I'm going to speak about something that's going to be very sensitive, very, probably emotional. And she looked at me. She said, Papa, I know. And that's a good thing. Because with social networking, with the way this world is today, our kids need to know more. They need to be protected more. And when I was asked to speak to you, I thought of a million reasons why I could not, why I should not. But when I look at my kids, I thought of a million and one reason why I should. <laughs> I am here because I stand here as a a father, a husband, a grandfather, a citizen, someone who cares about our kids. I stand here because I want to be responsible. I've had impact in the ring. I want to have impact outside the ring now. My, my journey, my odyssey, my nightmare began about 40 years ago. I was a young amateur boxer. But the thing about it, most people thought I was, no way, no way that Ray Charles Leonard, that's my name, would be a boxer. Because I, I was a very quiet kid, introverted, reserved, I was scared of my own shadow. So when my brother Roger, my older brother Roger, uh, told me to come to the gym, I went right away because I want to be like my big brother because he used to beat me up <laughs> for no apparent reason, <laughs> just because I was there. And I went to that gym, that boxing gym in Palmer Park, Maryland. And I put those gloves on. And all of a sudden, it was magic. It was magic. All of a sudden, they felt like a part of me. I found boxing. Boxing found me. We found each other. Whatever the case may be, it was beautiful. I gained more confidence. I had self-esteem. And because I was, so, I was so disciplined, I rose pretty fast. 
because I won all my fights. Then I heard about the Olympics. I heard the Olympics was the ultimate in any amateur competition. So that was my goal, the Olympics, and I, I went for it because I would run to school three, four miles, run back home, I trained, I, I, I had the perfect diet. I mean, I did everything necessary to give me the greatest chance to bring home a gold medal for myself and my country. So if you were a person, coach, individual, who had a notion or had knowledge of getting me there to the Olympics, I would listen. It's a thing we call trust. Trust. Trust is a very sacred thing, especially for young people, kids, for a young boxer. So I trusted these people, these two individuals that impacted my life. This guy, the coach, he was a coach, Olympic coach. And he told me everything I wanted to hear and more. And I remember like it was yesterday. I mean, I remember moments in my life to a T. I remember, I remember fighting in my most defining moments in the ring, how I felt in the 13th round, what punch hurt me, what was said in the corner. So I remember that, that person, that coach, who took me and a friend, one of my best friends, to, I think it was Utica, New York, to compete in this boxing tournament. And while we drove there from Washington, D.C., my friend and I, we, you know, we were like a pound overweight. So we had stopped at a restaurant and the coach said, all right, we're going to eat now. And we said, we can't eat, we can't eat because we're, we're overweight, we're pound overweight. He said, eat, and I will take care of that. So we ordered, naturally, a cheeseburger and french fries. <laughs> so once we got to the motel, he said, okay, I want you guys to, you know, get in the tub. And it, it was strange to me, getting in the tub. Um, but we were young, we just, and that was our coach. And I remember him pouring, I mean, tur I mean, turning the hot water on. And I, my friend and I got into the, into the tub together. And, and, and he pour, poured in some Epsom salt. And we were hot. We, we were on fire. But we started sweating all of a sudden. And I knew something was wrong, but I didn't question it because as he was messing around the water, he would touch us every now and then. And that was strange to me. I never, I never told anyone about that. Probably this is my second time telling this story. I knew something was really weird, something was really wrong, but I, I you know, that's, that's the coach. And then years went by, because I, that was for the 1972 Olympics, so I, I didn't qualify for that, but the 76 Olympics was my time because I will gain more experience. So I am looked upon as a favorite for the Olympics. And I recall one day he called me and picked me up from my house. And he drove me to a, um, a shopping center. It was, it was nighttime. And he was talking. He, he said, that, again, he said the right words. He knew exactly what to say. Because every time, I mean, I was, I was transfixed to his lips because every, you know, he was saying the Olympics, the gold medal, you were the best. But he said everything, everything that was necessary to gain my attention. And that's when he, he unzipped my pants. And I knew something was wrong because this is not right. This is not appropriate. And he, he, he did what he did. I jumped out of the car and I ran home. I ran home and uh, I was trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I mean, what happened just now? I mean, I, cr I, I cried. Um, I, w I, was in the, I went to my bedroom and 
I cried more. I cried so much it was painful. Never told anyone about that. Didn't tell my mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters. I didn't tell anyone. My girlfriend. I told no one. I kept that inside. And the next day I went to the gym. And I trained harder and harder and harder. I trained more than the, the next boxer. I trained harder than my, my opponent. And then, a few months later, it happened again with another guy who I trusted. Because he, he knew that I was looking forward to being in the Olympics and I didn't have a job, I needed money. I, you know, I had my, my son, little Ray, you know, I was a kid myself, so I didn't know, you know, I didn't know how to be a father, but I knew I had to have money to buy pampers, I think, probably wasn't pampers back then, uh, diapers? I don't know, <laughs> so buy diapers. And this guy who gave me money periodically, one night he called me, he called me. And um, I knew it was strange because he called me, normally I go to his place to get, I don't know, $50, $100, whatever it was. He would call me in the daytime, but this time it was at night. And I recall I had my little 1967 Chevy, blue Chevy Nova, and I drove over there. And again, you know how you, instinctively you, f you just feel it's not right, something's not right? It's your gut feeling tells you it's not right? And I went upstairs in his room. It was creepy. And he was sitting behind the desk. And he was saying, Ray, you know, uh, you are hope. You, 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 you really, you are going to be famous. You are going to win the gold medal. You're going to do this. He said everything that a kid would want to hear. And I just sat there. And all of a sudden, I found him standing, going behind me. And he put his hands on my shoulder. And I went right back to that, that, that coach. I went right back because it felt the same way. I mean, I can smell his breath right now. I said, not again. I said, God, please, not again. And he put his hand inside my shirt. And I'm shaking like a leaf. And he went down my pants. I just sat there and just put my head down. And I wanted to scream. And I jumped up. I grabbed the money first. And I took off. I'm sitting in my car. I'm shaking like, I don't know how I got home. I'm shaking like a leaf. And I'm crying. I mean, I'm just crying so hard. And again, it hurts to cry that hard. I get home. I told no one. And I dealt with that. I mean, I dealt with that. Because there was no book. There was no manual. There was no pamphlet. There was no... I never heard anyone talk about this. So it, to me, it only happened to me. I was the only one who was victimized by abuse, sexual child abuse. I was the only one, but twice. I didn't understand that. And I went by my merry way. I just continued, continued, continued to be productive in the boxing ring. So I won the gold medal. I brought it home in 1976 from Montreal. And um, my life was, it seemed like it was, you know, ready to be productive and be wonderful and be everything, you know, because I won the gold medal. I, I thought I was going to be like Bruce, Bruce Jenner, be on the Wheaties box. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't, I mean, at the time it wasn't perfect. So um, I recall turning professional. And all of a sudden, I started making money, started becoming more famous, more famous. Um, went through a failed marriage because, you know, I, I found myself in a world now that there was so much drugs and alcohol, and I consumed all of those things because it, it numbed me. When I, whenever I thought about those times, and, they, and periodically, they would show up. Whether I'm asleep or, I mean, I, if I had too much to drink, it, it would come back. 
those visions would come back. And um, I would just cry, just break down. I mean, I cried so much that I got tired of crying. I mean, I was hurting because I suppressed it. I kept it inside of me. I'm a fighter, you know. I beat guys up. So that's not the norm. Didn't know who to tell. And the first time I told my wife, my, my first wife, actually, I told her what had happened. I said, yeah, this guy did this to me and this guy. And she looked at me. And she said nothing. And right away, I looked at protection mode. So I changed the subject very quickly. And we just brushed it away. And then some 10, 15 years later, I'm married to my present wife. And I said to her one day, because the only time I bring it up was when I'm drinking. So I said, you know, this is what happened to me. And she had that same expression on her face. She looked at me, but she didn't answer. She didn't say anything. She didn't respond. And right away, I, went, I changed the subject and, and left it alone. But it bothered me whenever I had a lot to drink, because when I drank, my emotional stability would break down, and I would, I would not be what I call a man, because men don't cry. You know, guys don't cry, fighters don't cry. And um, I did this for years, for many, many years. Then what had happened, I consumed more and more alcohol, more and more alcohol, that um, eventually I became an alcoholic. Well, I, I, I accepted the fact that I was an alcoholic, and I, it'd be six years I've been sober. But my, 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 life, my life was not getting better because the reason that I, I took it upon myself to, to check myself, not even to check myself in, I just started going, started going to AA meetings, Alcoholic Anonymous meetings. But I knew I was in trouble when, because normally if I do a TV show or whatever interview, the night before I don't drink anything. I was just that disciplined. So this particular night, um, I was doing the uh, Regis and Kelly the night before, and I got, I got drunk. And I was hung over the next morning, so I went to the uh, studio, and Regis was talking to me, I was saying, Regis, just shut up, just shut up, just shut up. Because <laughs> I, I had a hangover, and I had a huge headache. Um, I knew I was in trouble, so when I got home, I went to a meeting, and it's been that way for six years now. So I, I still kept it to myself, and then I wrote a book, and I made that revelation that I was sexually abused. And it took a lot for me to, to write that. And I also did an audio version of the book. And it's even worse when you're in the studio, and you say, you're talking about yourself. You talk about your character defects. You talk about something that happened in your life that you try to forget. And I cried so much. I mean, I, I, I just couldn't take it. I just couldn't take it. But I know now that we must do something about this. It's so amazing to me. I feel so great in knowing that today we're going to start speaking out. We're going to speak up. We're going to talk about this thing. We can't let this thing destroy our kids. You know, I said years ago, I said, I, I don't want to be a poster child for check, uh, child sexual abuse. I can't, I can't be that. Yes, I am. I'm going to lead the way. I'm going to be the poster child. I don't care. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to speak out. Because no one deserves this. Our kids don't deserve this. And if we don't do something about this, if we don't come together as a community, as citizens, as parents, it's a shame. 
Because when I when when word came out that I was coming here, you know, I had people who who threatened to say bad things about me, to talk about my failed marriages, to talk about how bad I was. I, that, I mean, I found out that people don't want you to talk about these things because they are the ones who are doing these things. They want to keep it a secret, keep it quiet. I never told my therapist. And I've been going to her for, for years because it's, it, it's so uncomfortable. It really is. It really is uncomfortable. Not now for me. I mean, it, I get stronger every day. I get stronger every day. But if I'm going to be known for anything, oh yeah, I mean, I was a, a world championship boxer, world champion boxer. Yeah, I dance on Dance with the Stars. <laughs> but if I'm known to be one of the people who led the way to end, to eradicate sexual child abuse, that would be the greatest accomplishment of my life. <laughs> and you know what? And the great thing about today is the fact that today's technologies with social networking, uh, Facebook and Twitter, we can put all this stuff on there, you know? It, this is all positive. People need to hear more of this. And you know what? Again, use me. I will be that leader. I will stand right there and say, yes, something must be done now. Not later, now. That's a, you know that's that's as much as I can say. They had me booked for an hour. I can't talk an hour. But I, you know I, I'm 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 so proud of myself because again this was so, I mean first of all coming here from Los Angeles, my daughter was asleep. She didn't know I was I was I was thinking about what I had to say and I was crying on the plane. I mean I'm pulling my head down. Last night I was in bed. I was crying. This morning I was crying, and. Uh, Today, I really didn't cry that much. But um, it's real. This thing is real. This thing is horrible. This thing affects and damages lives. This thing kills our people, our kids. I would, have, I would be dead if I didn't have the courage. If I didn't have the courage to stand up and finally say, Ray, it's OK. It's okay, because we have to let these, our kids know that it's okay to talk about these things. If someone touch you inappropriately, tell me, please tell me, because there is a communication gap. There's a communication gap between parent and, and kid. There really is, because sometimes they feel uncomfortable and whatever, but once we gain that trust in them, they'll talk more about it. And... Um, there is no one answer, trust me, there is no one answer to this whole nightmare. But again, together, collectively, as we collaborate, we will find a way to end this thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you guys want to ask some ask questions, I'll be more than happy to answer whatever I can. They're getting some questions ready, but I see the audience has some. Okay. Yes. Thank you for your bravery and courage. It was beautiful. Um, I'm curious, what prompted you to, um, to disclose in your book and to start speaking publicly about this uh, difficult topic? 
when I was writing the book, um, it, well, my my partner uh, Michael Arkush, um, he, I was talking about, I, I was briefly talking about the abuse from the coach and from the other guy, and then I shut down because it, it it was too much, it was too painful, and then that evening. I was watching Oprah, and Todd Bridges was on Oprah, and he he too was talking about child abuse. And I just I just I couldn't believe he was talking about this. And the next day, when my writer came to my house, I I, <clears throat> I talked about it. And I broke but I broke down. It was very difficult. But the more I talked about it, the more I talked about it. As painful as it was. The weight on my shoulders was was lifted. It was I, I felt better about myself. It's a weird thing. It's a weird thing that all these years, forty some years, I beat myself. I beat myself up. It it was killing me. I mean, although although I I, I married, I mean, it, two beautiful women. I mean, um, and all. Due respect to my first wife, Juanita. I mean, I, I wasn't the best husband. I, I, you know, and whether or not this whole thing affected me, who knows? But I, I, I wasn't the, the the kid my parents worked so hard for me to become. You know, um, my life was going. My life was was fading. My people saw me. They saw externally, they saw me on, they saw the face, they saw me smiling, and it was real. I mean, I, I was happy. But when I was by myself, I was, I was dying inside. And um, God, I mean, my life has changed so much by speaking, by speaking up and speaking out, by talking about this thing. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Um, I remember uh, cheering you on and applauding you in, um, as a teenager in our living room at home. And I think that um, today you've become even more of a hero to many of us. Um, and what I'm wondering is when you were um, younger and these things happened, um, and you said your parents were working hard on your behalf, well, what do you think, um, if you could say, was preventing you from talking with your family or parents or letting people know, if not what happened, how you were feeling? My parents, um, they, 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 they loved us, they loved the kids, but we didn't have, um, there was no real um, communication with my parents. It's not their fault, it's just because their parents never, and their parents, it, it's a cycle. And <clears throat> I want to break that cycle. Um, I talk to my kids as much as I can. Um, that's my daughter, Camille, there. Stand up, Camille, please. <laughs> yes. Because I want to gain trust in my daughter and in my, in my younger son, Daniel, who is 11. Because my daughter is, is 15 years old, and um, uh, they grow too fast. They grow up too fast. Um, and I want her to be, I want her to have more co co enough confidence to, to talk to me about anything. A boyfriend, which will be later. <laughs> <laughs> school, um, whatever, you know. I, I want her to be comfortable enough to talk to me about anything. Because that, I think that's one of the main things, or one of the main answers that um, we need f from our kids. I think our kids need, there needs to be, not, I'm not just saying be a friend, just be a friend, because you gotta stay a parent. But there has to be that, you know what I mean? There has to be that connection, that open line of communication. Uh, Sugar Ray, we had the pleasure of meeting last night. You met two of my good friends, Gracie and Grant. Uh, I tell, just want to tell them say, I said hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I just want to say, and maybe I speak on behalf of every male survivor in this room, it's thrilling to be here with you. It's thrilling to listen to your story. It's thrilling to hear your commitment to reach out and help and help stop this horrible epidemic and violation of our children. And as a follow-on, I would ask, how do, we con how do we at Voice Today contact you so that we can engage you at the right time uh, with our work? Well, I am on Facebook, Twitter. I mean, there, and um, I have, in fact, my personal assistant, Katie, stand, stand up, Katie. <laughs> yes, All right. so you can contact me by speaking with her. Thank you. And we have some questions in the front, I think, now. People have submitted questions okay. to the panel. Thank you again for your courage and in sharing your story today. Um, one of the questions is, what, um, what would you say to young people who might be struggling right now, suffering from sexual abuse and silence? The killer is silence. When you're silent, that, it, it, it eats your insides. It, it, tears at, it tears at your heart. That's what I experience. I mean, it messes with your mind. I mean, it, it just totally just, it's such a toxin, it's such a poison. Um, it would never go away until you find it in your heart to speak up and speak out against it or about it. Um, I think just talk to someone um, who, you, who you trust, I should say, whether it's a parent or best friend, but speak up and speak out. Thank you for coming, sharing your time with us today. Um, the question I have is um, when you think backward from now uh, on your experiences, do you think that there were things that might have been lifelines for you at the time if they existed? If you think of what we could do for youth who might be in a similar situation, what kinds of um, communication lines or other sorts of services might have been of help to you? That's a very uh, difficult question to answer um, because when it happened, I mean, first of all, there's such a stigma to being abused, sexually abused, you know, that you're weak, that you are, uh, uh, you're embarrassed, that you caused it, it's your fault. I mean, all those, I mean, first of all, we had, we had to think about all those other th um, things that were, the negative that was coming at us. And no one wanted to speak up or speak out against it because they, there was no support system like there is today. I, I think that we need to continuously f form this, uh, this bond, this, this group, this, this support system because that's what we need and that's what they need is a support system. As an athlete, did you feel um, like uh, the abuse that you endured um, affected your athletic performance in any way or, or um... you know um, that too is a very um, interesting question because um, in the ring um, I kick butt you know <laughs> I mean I really I mean I was I, I felt safer in the ring I just felt so much safer. You know, in fact, it was asked of me, do I think that because of what happened to me, uh, did that make me fight harder? I, I don't know, I don't, I don't think so, but who knows? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know, but one thing about it though, um, I, was, I was so determined in the ring for some apparent reason, I don't know. That's a, again, you, I guess you can see I'm struggling with trying to find a good answer, but I, I just don't know. When you were able to come forward and disclose, what was the reaction from your family, uh, media and extended family? Um, they were, first of all, shocked. They, 
I, I, I think we, I think things, bad things, we, we tend to not, I don't want to say not believe them, but we kind of want to get them away, get them out, get them away from us as soon as possible, forget about it. Um, I haven't really talked to my parents about this, you know. I, I think they're probably also at an age now. My father, my father turned 90 in June, and my mom is a feisty 83 year old. <laughs> uh, but we don't we don't talk about it. I mean, I did bring it up quick, very 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 quickly with them, um, but um, most of the time, I don't have conversations with my family members about this. In fact, I have I have not had any conversations with my family about this, it's about the subject matter. Not no no. My brothers um, no. My my sister no. No one has talked about it. Or no one's brought it up, because again, it's some. It's a very. It's a very very painful, uncomfortable subject matter. You know, you just don't want to. You just don't want to believe it happened. But it did happen, and it will continue to happen until we do something about it. This next question comes from a survivor as well. The question is, when do we forget and when do we forgive? When do we forget and when do we forgive? Um, you have to have to forgive right away. You have to surrender. You have to just let it be. It happened. But you'll never forget it. You never forget. But you gotta forgive. Just because if I didn't forgive those two people, I wouldn't be up here today. I'd be in a bar. I'd be in a club. I won't forget it. I'll never forget it. But you have to surrender and just move on with your life. You really have to. I mean, again, it's not as easy as it sounds. It takes a lot of <coughs> your high power, whatever that is, it takes that too. But you have to come to grips with what happened and not blame yourself and not beat yourself up like I did. I beat myself up for years. And the more I beat myself up, the matter I got. Because I kept saying, it's my fault. It's my fault. I could have knocked those guys out. And I could have. I could have. No. I mean, I mean these, these guys were old. <laughs> out of shape. Out of shape. Bad hair. I mean, <laughs> you know, but, but you know, but you know, sometimes you got to even laugh about it. Just get it out of the way. You know, it's, it's painful. I'm, trust me, it is painful. Very, very painful. But you got to turn a negative into a positive. You got to move on. You got to move on. Thank you. you. You mentioned that other young boxers were also abused. How difficult was it to talk to other peers? It's not, it appears to be not as prevalent among boxers, but I don't know because you, you we're finding out that, you know, um, through the news and through social networking that it's, it's a little bit more prevalent in, in, in athletics and sports and what have you. Uh, you know, I heard, you know, um, football, baseball, I mean, it, it happens across the board. It's... It's not really the sport. It's, it's the person that is, is uh, the, bad, the bad one. It's, a bad, it's, a, it's that person that makes this th these things happen. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a certain sport. But I do know this. And I, I mean, I'm not a doctor or a psychologist or whatever, but... I know fully well that one of the things that drew me in to these people was trust. Trust is a big word. It's a very significant and important word. I trusted that coach. I trusted that guy 
who gave me money because I had a dream and I was a dream, I had a dream that I was not going to not make happen, not make come to fruition. And they were, they were supporters, if you will, that was going to help me make my dream come true. So it's the trust. But our kids need to be taught and understand about things that are inappropriate, whether it's touching or it's even, even, even things they say. You know, certain words, certain things they say. Uh, our kids, we live in a strange, we live in a strange time. Uh, uh, we live in a, in a period, a technology area, time that things happen so fast. So, so fast. And there's more communications uh, that goes about with our kids to other people that we have no idea. I mean, I'm just learning how to tweet and learn how to do Facebook. You know, and uh, uh, these things do happen. We just have to be aware of them. You know, just be aware of your kid, uh, of who they're uh, texting and who they are. Uh, I mean, is this some, is, is it Instagram? What, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> All those things, guys. Today we heard some research that says um, child sexual abuse isn't necessarily about power and control. What do you think about that? Do you think it was about power and control? Power and control. I, I just think it's a, it's an, a mental illness. Uh, you know, and again, don't hold me to that. I, I just think that anyone that does that, and knowing fully well that they're going to destroy that kid's life, they should be locked up. They should be locked up <laughs> for life. You talked to, um, about the trust you had in those two men. How did that betrayal of trust impact you in terms of trusting others in your life? It took me, boxing took me from under the rock. Boxing gave me a sense of, 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 a sense of self, uh, confidence, and what have you. When, that, when those moments took place, I almost went back under that rock, but my sport, boxing, kept me above the water, if you understand what I'm saying. It kept me afloat. I was drowning, 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 but the more I competed, the more, I, I, the more toxin I got out of my system. That's it for the questions that we have. Once again, I want to thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story with all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>